Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to be with you here at this uh, center of excellence in Southeast Asia. In fact, a center of excellence well known all, all around the world. Uh, I don't have very much time, but I've got a subject which is, uh, well, very, very large to cover. Um, the format which I'm going to follow is that uh, just I'm assuming that there are problems sometimes that people have about accent. You know, understanding a South Asian accent may not be very easy for some people. So I've got a lot of my material put on the slides themselves. I know it's very rude putting uh, text on slides, but I've got it all there for you to read in case you wish to read and if you're not really following me very easily. But I do think I've got a global accent which can be understood. <laughs> which can be understood. Okay. Very correctly, very aptly summed up at the beginning of the lecture itself by Dr. Rajesh. Comparison. This morning's International Herald Tribune covers a couple of stories on India. A editorial. There's an, edit an, an editorial which gives out the sad story. Then there's, there are some internal security issues of India which are also covered. Some communal riots where 31 people have died uh, in the last three, four days. I I'll be alluding to these things sometime later. So it appears that everything is in distress in India. 2006, when I was attending the Royal College of Defense Studies program at London, everything was gaga at that time, you know, elation, hope, very high self-esteem. And uh, we were all hyphenated with China. 2013, suddenly, the fall of gloom. Low economic indi indices, a very diluted sense of self-confidence and self-esteem. Has everything gone askew? Has everything gone astray? That is the moot point that we are looking at. And uh, I dare say we've got to look at security from, uh, from that angle. And I'll talk about the manner in which we look at security. So is this a possible tactical and a short-term downturn in India's march towards uh, its deserved status? Is it a tactical one? Is it a strategic one? Is it a long-term one? Is it a short-term one? These are the things which the world is looking at and we are looking at internally. This is the format of things I would like to cover. I've got it all here, but time may not permit me to cover everything. And uh, therefore, I will, if from every slide, I'll pick up one or two issues so that I'm well within my time and really have enough time available for our interaction. So I'm going to be looking at defining security in very, very broad terms. The national objectives, national security objectives of India, which have never been defined by us ourselves. Perceptions on India's capability, security paradigm known to very few outside India. Political security, identified primary strengths, main deficit, internal and external security, and shaping of India's national security. So defining such security. I want to make it very clear right at the beginning itself that I'm not a uh, well, a soldier who looks at security only from the angle of border. Everything is well inside the border and everything is wrong inside. Right? I mean, you've got secure borders, but insecure internally, there's no point having that kind of a security. So what we are looking at is a comprehensive model, not just physical border security. This includes economic vitality, national resilience, character, political strength, and it looks at the cultural paradigm, it looks at soft power, it looks at technical and scientific temper within the ambit of educational, uh, education and research. It talks about freedom, influence, and control. All this makes up security in my, the manner in which I look at it, and I'm sure the manner in which all uh, practitioners of security look at it. And it's best analyzed against the backdrop of national objectives. Now, if you, are, if you studied India's national security at, from any angle, you would probably realize then never has this been identified, never has this been put down in black and white. But uh, there has to be a beginning somewhere and there has to be a standpoint, there has to be a point of reference, and this is my point of reference. I've chosen the, the uh, Indian Defense and Security uh, Analyses, uh, Institute of Defense and Security and, and Analyses in India, uh, which is one of our important think tanks, who have articulated it officially, not, not officially, but this is something what they have gone about doing. Within territorial integrity and secure borders, look at all this. Core values, democracy, secularism, sovereignty, part of our constitution. Ensure socioeconomic development, quality of life, all other aspects, gender, equality, health, sanitation, education, 
resolve disputes peacefully and play a positive role in global and regional affairs, control over the skies, resources within acceptable international norms, and anything impinging on achieving these objectives should be considered a threat. Well, there could be different other ways of looking at India's national security. This is a one way of looking at it. So anything which impinges on this, on the achievement of this, is considered a threat. And our, our intent would be how to ward off that threat. Well, there have been variants, there has been a lot of variants in uh, perceptions on India's capability, overall capability. You know, earlier, there was a clear upward trajectory since 1998. Everyone said, yes, everything on the up now. Especially after in 1999, after so-called victory in the Kargil War, uh, overcoming problems of 2001 and 2002 when we almost went to war with Pakistan. But then there started that period, brief period of about eight to nine, ten years when we averaged over 7% growth, touching 95 and almost touching 10% at one stage. Then there came a qualified analysis of slow rise. You know, if there's an Indian model, it cannot be a Chinese model. The Chinese model is an overheated economy uh, going up to 13 to 14% 14 in 1993, 94 at one stage. The Indian model is a slow, steady, will probably get us there in good time and will probably embed itself. That was the way of looking at it. Subsequently, it became clumsy and an unguaranteed rise. The rise was still there. But it's unguaranteed, very clumsy way of doing things. One thing is very clear, there has never been consens a consensus on India's future. Many people internally, many, many scholars internally, always doubted it. We, they always wondered whether we were getting it right or not. But the years 2005, 6, 7, 8, particularly when we were hitting 8, more than 8% growth, everything, everyone was gaga about it. And uh, perhaps many were overlooking the realities that somewhere lurking around the corner, there were problems. And uh, 2008 particularly, when the downturn in the American economy, the Western economies started, um, although I'm no, I'm no economist, I, my understanding of the economy is very, very poor, but I could also understand this much. We felt that if there's a downturn in the economy in the West, it would hit us very soon. It didn't. 2009, 10, 11, we weathered the storm, and we felt very confident. But by 2012, 2013, things have started going wrong. Obviously, now in 2013, the upturn in the American economy, possible upturn in European economies, you may find that we are finding that a lot of investment, which would have come our way, is possibly going that way. And that is why some of the, much of our capital is probably going there. And that is one of the reasons why we're not being able to achieve the kind of growth that we were intending to. Uh, the common perception about India's attitude towards security. This is also very important. Commonly understood, there is a lack of a strategic culture in India. You know, 65, 67 years as a nation. Uh, we have never come to terms with what really is required in terms of our security. And uh, we've been happy to keep postponing this because within ourselves itself, uh, we have never taken security as, a, as an important subject. It's never been really studied. You see the number of think tanks which were in India, um, well, till, till about five to 10 years ago, you'd be surprised for a population of 1.1, 1.2 billion, you possibly had just one major think tank and that was the IDSA itself, nothing more. Uh, so this is one thing which holds us back tremendously. No coherent national security strategy, no review from time to time, no formalized strategic review process. So it just goes on from year to year. You just move on without actually carrying out a major review internally. Although at the government level, different departments exist, and I'll talk about that just now. There is no clarity on our influence and control, the limits of our influence and control, Many people think that we can go well beyond, you know, looking at uh, beyond the region, the near abroad region. Some think that we can, we need only to grow internally first. So really there's not much clarity in that. <clears throat> and societies such as India normally tend to get very complacent about security. Particularly when economics starts playing a very important role and 
you have a huge middle class which suddenly finds an upsurge in its quality of life, um, something which it has been looking for for very long, you find that uh, much emphasis goes on that quality of life, living, etc. And the intellectual part of security and growth suddenly takes a, you know, a back step. However, despite all this, despite all the negatives I, I've spoken about, um, there are things, there are, there, are, uh, informal, there are informal ways by which we look at our security. Uh, right on top, we have the Cabinet Committee for Security, the CCS, which is responsible for apex-level security. That's the one which uh, gives out all the directions, etc. But uh, reviews, official black and white reviews, don't come from this institution either. Then you have the National Security Advisory Board, which is something which was set up only about a couple of years ago. You have the National Security Council under the National Security Advisor. You have the Planning Commission, which is looking, which is not really a which is not really an institution for security, but uh, being one of the apex bodies for economic planning. You have, a you have many proliferating think tanks now all over, Delhi particularly, the Center for Policy Research, Delhi Policy Group, and um, uh, lots of others, you know, Center for Land Warfare Studies, you, the Army, Navy, and Air Force have set up their own things. Very importantly, we've got a very, very active media. In fact, an over the active media. If you, if you, uh, switch on Indian channels sometime and particularly watch a channel called Times Now and you get onto the famous personality called Arnab Goswami. I wonder if you've seen him. Uh, they call him General Goswami. You know, because he's the one who thinks he knows everything about India. You know, everything which is good. And he questions everyone. It's a very good thing to have all this. The only thing is he's, he's uh, a little over, uh, you know, offensive in his, in his approach towards, towards things. But uh, it's a very good thing, a very good active media which keeps a watchdog kind of a attitude towards all things which are happening in India. And uh, what is important is that we are not short on intellect, on brain power, or management. But what we are really horribly short on is consensus. That is something which we really need to get our act together on. I suppose uh, many people say India is just too democratic. You know, it takes its core value of democracy, the democracy a little too seriously. And that is why everyone has got an opinion and everyone wants to express an opinion. A lot of people say the most argumentative community in the world are South Asians, actually. You know, we love to have opinions about everything. And that leads us, actually, this whole aspect of not having a consensus, leads us to major problems at the, at the political level. Can I, can I show you, put this for you here? Otherwise, you know, uh, it has. You have major problems at the at the security at, at the political level. But before I go to that, go on to that. Let me just tell you that from these institutions which I just spoke about, many papers come out from time to time, and. Uh, they get discussed, but at the end, a consensus paper on India's national security never emerges. So you have all these things available to you. You've got uh, the definition of national security and objectives in various think tanks. You've got the assessment of emerging security environment with different organizations in India keep coming up with every year, the National Security Council, the various intelligence directorates uh, themselves. Uh, you, have a, you have an identification of your national strengths and weaknesses. and. Uh, the various resources which are required to meet these challenges. All this is there, but the only problem is we don't have an unclassified paper with a broad understanding uh, about uh, national security at the national level. Uh, what I was talking about a little earlier, uh, this lack of a consensus always leads to this problem of political security, and that's the start point actually, particularly in, in today's India. There is no consensus at the political level on various decisions which need to be taken for the good of the country. And there are some reasons for it which are here for you to look at. Many people say that we are actually many nations in one, heterogeneous character uh, of the country, which is true in many ways, but we've got to act together wonderfully otherwise, in, except in a few areas such as security. Uh, regional and caste polarization, different interest groups, leads to a fractured polity, too many parties, not like the American system where you have two parties, the Republicans and the 
Democrats or something like that. Here you have hundreds of parties, fractured polity. Uh, since 1996, we really haven't come to a, a proper mandate for a single party. We've always lived by coalitions, and that is the thing we are going to live with for a long time to come. Possibly the next uh, elections in 2014, March or April. We will see a much more fractured mandate. Uh, we don't know how this entire thing will be cobbled together to put, put, a, to the, put a government which could work at that particular time. So this is a major, major deficit in political security. But we have certain strengths which need to be taken stock of. We have, uh, we have been able to progressively integrate our minorities, and I'm, I know it's a, very, it's a paradoxical thing to say it, on a day when I'm saying that there is a communal riot in India which has taken place the last three days, 31 people have died. But this is a part of a fractured politics. It's happened in the state of UP, uh, where there is a party which is uh, running the state, which is different from the party and the coalition running the central government. There are things they come to loggerheads. And this leads to problems here and there. But that doesn't mean that this problem is an everyday kind of a problem. Progressively, the integration of minorities has been, has been a success story as far as India is concerned. Democracy and secularism, as I was saying, over-democratic. Secularism, yes, secular character of the nation has been maintained. A lot of people question it from time to time. A lot of people say that we are too secular, perhaps. Uh, that's something for discussion. We have a huge demographic profile, a huge middle class, uh, which is a potential market for the world at any time. We have a sound technological base, very strong institutions, such as the Supreme Court. Uh, I count the Indian Army, all the three Indian Armed Forces among them, National uh, Security, the NSAB, the CAG, the CIC, which is the Central Information Commission, intelligence agencies, the Reserve Bank of India, many, many strong institutions in the country, which are very run very well. We have a good corporate culture. Uh, if you take away the controls, perhaps this can become much, much better. A very good entrepreneurial class with the high-profile names such as the Bunnies, Tatas, Birlas, and we've got a huge diaspora abroad. Much of the money uh, which India has used for this progress comes in from there. And people abroad today are actually, you know, bringing their hands in glee with the cost of the dollar going up to 68 rupees, now coming down to 66 again. A lot of people, maybe in Singapore themselves, are taking a lot of money from their banks and putting it back in India. Because that's where the, the uh, interest rates are, are going up in a huge way. So there are positives. But the problem is that all these positives can, could, at the same time, become potential weaknesses. For example, the young demographic profile that you have, the huge middle class that you have, now, if you have got a huge demographic profile, a young demographic profile, there is no point having 500 million young people less than 30, 35 years old who are not educated enough, who do not have the right skills, and who cannot be absorbed in society in any positive way. That will lead to that much negativity. If you have 500 million people who are negatively inclined, you can imagine which side the country will go. And... Uh, Besides that, uh, you may talk about a sound technological base, but at the same time, I don't think we have been able to achieve the scope that we actually had to be able to achieve this kind of a base. We don't have the kind of research and development which has taken place in other parts of the world. Although a scientific temper exists, much of our scientific talent happens to migrate abroad and become part of the larger diaspora, Indian diaspora in other countries. Main deficit, which I'm sure you'll be reading about the media everywhere, the word corruption, of course, comes number one. Weak governance ever since there have been pressure, politics, fractured politics from 1996 onwards, a very rigid bureaucracy, um, indecision particularly, lack of consensus, possibly major administrative reforms which are required, castles in politics. We have lots and lots of incidences you know, people not too happy with the government. In one state itself, in the state of Manipur, we have 34 militant groups. 34 militant groups in one single state, which is one of the smallest states of India, Manipur. So you see how, how it keeps you back. Um, let me give you an example of this. 
the famous Trans-Asian Economic Corridor, which was to come up from India into Myanmar, into Thailand, and into the rest of Southeast Asia. From 2005 onwards, we've been looking at this to happen. A lot of money has been given to this. But Manipur itself, Nagaland, Manipur, and these areas which are in the throes of some kind of incidency, low-level incidency, does not permit this corridor to come up. That's a major problem. Poor policing, uh, food distribution, that is in the news a lot these days with the food distribution bill. Problems of health, sanitation, urban administrations. When I come to Singapore, I marvel at your urban administration capability of the government of Singapore to be able to get us act together on this. Very, very important aspect. Somehow this has is, this eluded is uh, India for a long time, and we will have to get our act together. Poorly streamlined defense sector. I'm not talking about India's physical capability, security capability to provide security on the borders. I am essentially talking about our acquisition capability. And I'm sure this is something that Anit has also been looking at a lot in his research. Our, our acquisition capability, you know, very, very archaic procedures and our inability to be able to trust people and, and get things done on time. It has taken the better part of now 25 years since India has been able to get a single gun, a modern gun into India. The last was the Bofors in 1987. It led to the famous Bofors scandal. It put off everything and since then, We've been so careful about our acquisition program that we've not been able to buy ourselves a gun, right? So that, these are the kind of things which, which, have, which provide setbacks. The list is long. We've got problems in environment, population growth, terrorism, no doubt all over India, that is, street violence. When it comes to terror, you are aware, I'll talk about it in the internal security part a little later. Yeah, in the internal security. You know, there are subnational aspirations everywhere. There is a divide between the haves and the have-nots. And there are trans-border havens because of the Indocentric nature of the subcontinent where our 11 neighbors around us all share borders with us. There are political vote banks. Our police forces are not sufficiently geared up to be able to fight in a, mo in a modern way to be able to fight internal or provide internal security. They have to depend a lot on the Indian Army to keep getting drawn into internal security. And then you have the major problem of the Red Corridor. At one time, uh, almost uh, 220 districts of India were actually affected by the Maoist problem. Now, this is a very awkward issue which everyone needs to take stock of. You see, this is essentially a development issue. The areas where the Maoist problem exists today are the areas which are resource rich. You know, a lot of mines and underground resources you have there. Uh, to develop those areas, you have to move out people. You have to give them compensation. And that, then you don't have economically viable models which are available to you to pro provide that compensation and uh, be able to get the industry to get its act together. And so you create disaffected populations, which leads to this kind of a problem. I was reading about it this morning on the International Health Tribune also. Um, same problem existing in China. It's happening in portions of China today where they've gone in to try and evict some people and there have been some suicides by people there. So the same kind of a problem exists here. Uh, the new land compensation bill, uh, on one hand, is a very good thing where it will probably provide more for the, for the farmers who are dispossessed of their land, etc. But at the same time, it is going to discourage uh, many of those people who would want to come up and set up industry in India, invest in India, because they know that this is just the beginning. The next three to five years, we will see how the execution of the land compensation bill is going to be actually done on ground, and this is going to possibly produce more disaffection uh, among, 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 the, among the poorer sections of society. And of course, Kashmir remains the oldest set. I hope you've been reading about what's happened with the Zubin Mehta uh, famous event which has just taken place on the banks of the Dal Lake and the Shalimar Gardens. You see a small innocuous event such as this can produce major problems in a state like Kashmir where um, this event was being put up basically for celebration, you know, bringing home the, the 
the pleasures of, uh, of uh, music in, in, in this wonderful season that exists in Kashmir at this time. But it was, it was politically you know, taken around by a lot of people, swung around by a lot of people. Uh, people spoke about um, you know, an Israeli connection with it and things like that. And they had a, they had a parallel music festival 10 kilometers away in a different place. Um, this kind of a thing keeps happening in Kashmir all the time to make sure that Kashmir remains center stage. It, it must not lose its importance in the eyes of the world, so-called. I've had many, many tenures in Kashmir. The last was at the Corps Commander in Kashmir. I can assure you, uh, today the situation in Kashmir is that you are down to just 300 terrorists. Um, it's a hearts and minds game today. Um, if anyone asks me what is the mission of the Indian Army today in Kashmir, my answer would be, no longer about killing any terrorists or capturing terrorists. It's all about integrating Kashmiri society. And that was my aim in 2010-11, which I did, was, um, you know, I went uh, way beyond the, the winning hearts and minds concept and I took it to a much, much higher level to try and make sure that you send a message to the Kashmiri population that they are part of India. Uh, as far as external security is concerned, few issues. I haven't even spoken about Pakistan, I haven't spoken about China, we could speak, we could discuss it a little later. Few issues which you need to just flag. One is that physically, geographically, geostrategically, we are very, very close to the new great game, the areas of the new great game. When you look at the Pamir Knot, and you see the areas emanating from around the Pamir Knot, you look at Central Asia, you look at Xinjiang, you look at Afghanistan, or this uh, southern portion that is into northern Pakistan, Gilgit, Hunza, and places like that, and come down to Kashmir. This is the region of the new great game. You're aware of the energy corridors which are coming up in this region, a new energy corridor coming up from China, all the way going down to Gwadar, which is going to change the scheme of things completely. The Indian Ocean region, the sea routes, sea lines of communication, uh, will become diluted in their strategic importance of this energy corridor and this commercial corridor between China Pakistan and into the warm waters of the Indian Ocean comes around. Lots of things are happening here. And we are, we are, the proximity of India to it uh, obviously create, creates uh, concerns for us. The adverse effects of uh, Afghanistan, the APAC region, uh, when the ISAF withdraws next year, if they withdraw next year, 2014, will they withdraw whole stock, lock, stock and barrel or are they going to be left some remnant elements there to continue looking after the security? The, the overall stabilization of that region, we don't know. But obviously, whatever happens there is going to have an effect here. A ripple effect of anything in Afghanistan will always be felt in Kashmir, northern India, or we can say overall security of India. Uh, stand off with China. Things are happening on the, on the Chinese border. Um, awkward things which uh, get, keep getting reported. There isn't too much truth always in everything which is reported. Uh, because that area is remote, not too much of uh, reliable information comes out from there, but this awkward standoffs for once in a while between patrols and the perception of the line of actual control, that is what actually leads to all these kind of problems. I do admit that these problems are a little more than what they were earlier, but I must explain that this kind of a problem has existed on the Sino-Indian border for many, many years. It's the information revolution of the world which has brought it center stage. Um, all this happened earlier. You know, you had incursions into each other's territory because the perceptions of the line of actual control uh, are vague, absolutely. Then you have the Pakistan factor. A lot of people say uh, the famous question, is a stable Pakistan good for India? Is unstable Pakistan good for India? What is actually good for India? That's something which one could always uh, discuss. But one thing is very clear. Uh, anything happening in Pakistan obviously has an effect on us. Physically has a major effect on us. And uh, I dare say for the last, uh, what, 20, 24 years, ever since the Kashmir problem started off, sponsorship of uh, problems, proxy war problems internally inside India, we have always felt that, the, that it always came from Pakistan. It was sponsored from that side to keep the fires burning uh, inside India. And that is something which uh, we have never diluted our stance on that. And then you have issues of regional imbalance as far as uh, 
uh, Sri Lanka, because of, because of this Indocentric nature of, our, of the subcontinent, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, little, little, little bit of um, land corridors or uh, you know, territorial little problems which do act as pinpricks but nothing very serious. Uh, a recent problem has just taken place with Myanmar where I think the Myanmar army has come in and occupied a certain area which is under dispute. Now these things are, can be ironed out. It's, it's not such a major issue. What has really not been fully realized is the Look East policy. And uh, let me admit that uh, it is partially, it happened, you see in 1989 with the end of the Cold War, uh, there was an American shift towards uh, the Asia Pacific region. There was an automatic shift that India also started looking at towards the east, but then came the Gulf Wars, then came Afghanistan, and of course we've been having a problem with Pakistan on our western borders. So as a result, as much as we would like to have our gaze towards the, towards the east, as everyone in India realizes that it is the east which is the future, right? But much against that, we've been forced to keep looking west. The energy, our energy all comes from the west, Iran, now Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the Persian Gulf area. So that is a major issue of concern for us. A few other issues, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Yes, we are in that region where all those things are happening. Iran itself, uh, Pakistan, India, we are in the middle of that region. The control of sea lanes for all the traffic which goes towards the Far East through the Straits of Malacca. Um, India sits as like a crown on top of the Indian Ocean. Everyone expects, uh, thinks that possibly India needs to have that kind of sea power to be able to control or at least dominate the sea lines of communication. Uh, we obviously have to take our naval power many notches higher and that is a, that's a very expensive uh, way of doing things. Most important for us is resource procurement and protection. And um, in this come two things, basic energy, carbons, hydrocarbons, and water. Hydrocarbons, well, we need to start looking, of course, at how the perspective is going to change around the world with fracking and shale gas, right? Uh, if the Middle East starts diluting in strategic importance as an energy crucible, then, then uh, how is it going to affect India? Will our, will our area for concern be Central Asia, right? Where will we get our gas from? Will it be from America? Will it be from Canada? Or will India and China come together for this? Because these are the three areas where much of the uh, shale gas of the world is going to be. And of course, we need to be looking at the effect of the US pivot in Asia, part of the Obama doctrine, um, where after the Iraq, the Gulf War, the, the engagement in Iraq, and the AFPAC region, uh, a natural thing that the United States would be looking at would be towards Southeast Asia where its major interests lie and where it is, will be in far closer proximity physically to China. Now, I'm sorry for the spelling. This is a typical Indian Army spelling. I'm sure Anit would know. Christianity is always spelled in the Indian Army as Christianity. You know. <laughs> so, so, so that's just a, a side there. But uh, some summary of our major perceptions that I've spoken about. Our national security policy obviously needs broader analysis, participation, and consensus. It should write domestic po override domestic policies. And with less firefighting, there is something we need to get over. We need to have a more strategic perspective of things long term. A new global information order, we should be very clear where the new global information order is. Where is it going to take us? It requires much more coherence, aptitude, and attitude from us to look at information. Information as a weapon, perhaps, of the future. Uh, we must cater for continuous engagement with friend or foe. There's no question of saying that so-and-so is our foe, so no engagement. The world, mature nations, mature strategic communities around the world, all look at friends and foe alike. Religious extremism is a major problem that we need, uh, need to be concerned about. Last night I was at the global town hall. Uh, four major cities of the world, Singapore included, were linked together to talk about this whole aspect of religious extremism and violent extremism and counter-narratives to that. 
a lot of concern in America particularly, a lot of concern, and therefore naturally all around the world also. There's something in India we need to be concerned about. We have a 150, 160 million, uh, 160 million strong minority. It's rare in nations to find a minority of 160 million people. Muslims in India are 160 million. And uh, I would say to a lot of American friends, out of this, point out how many Muslims from India have been affected by the Al-Qaeda. And that's a very strange aspect to find. Almost the Al-Qaeda the Qaeda has not been able to touch India. Much of the, much of the extremist, religious extremist trends which translate into, into terrorism, etc., comes from the lashkar e taiba the jaish e Muhammad, which are primarily Pakistan-based elements, which have got fringe connections with Al-Qaeda, but much of the sponsorship, the financing, etc., everything comes internally from Pakistan. And then, therefore, just a few things. We need to be looking at all these things, and it goes without saying we need to engage China very, very proactively and very positively, because we know that our linkages are such the trade and economics, India and China, cannot be afforded to be seen uh, having made a difference. Um, we've got to maintain a balance with the United States. So we are midway somewhere at the center. Perhaps we are the best placed to be friends with both China and America. An aspect which I need to just emphasize a little bit about is the aspect of the defense budget. India is one of the rare nations, 1.75% of the budget goes to defense. China is almost 4%. Pakistan is over 3%. And uh, with 1.7% and looking at uh, strong northern borders, I don't think the Indian Army or Indian Armed Forces can actually achieve much uh, over the next five years or so. This, this budget will have to go up. But if the state of the economy is going to be what it is at the moment, I don't think we can afford to spend that much more on defense spending. Last few elements, technology, education, Cyber security, these will be our key concerns. Social antipathy, overall foreign policy formulation, and very importantly, using soft power and promoting international tourism. The Bollywood model, you know, nothing better than the Bollywood model. Sell the Bollywood model around the world, Indian soft power. If we can do this in other, in other areas, it would be wonderful. It's all about comprehensive security but we need to have a focused approach on our areas of concern. That brings me to the end of this talk. I have kept it very, very generic, very, very generic, as you've seen, without focus too much on borders, etc., but touched upon almost every element of comprehensive security, right? And therefore, I leave at the end. I wonder if you recognize me in this avatar of mine, <laughs> but you could give me a feedback on this email ID. Thank you.